Now let's talk about how we extract ERPs from the raw EEG using signal averaging. As I mentioned before, the EEG is basically the sum of everything the brain is doing. It can indicate someone's general state, whether they're asleep, drowsy, or wide awake, but the raw EEG can't reveal the detailed neurocognitive processes that underlie thought and emotion. For that, we want to look at event-related potentials, voltages that are related to a specific event, such as a stimulus or a response. And to see the ERPs, we need to know exactly when each event happened. So most labs use two computers, one that presents the stimuli and records the responses, and another that records the EEG. The stimuli are usually auditory or visual, but some studies use somatosensory, olfactory, or even gustatory stimuli. Anytime a stimulus is presented or a response occurs, an event code is sent from the stimulus presentation computer to the recording computer. This indicates what the event was and exactly when it occurred. If we look at the raw EEG, there isn't a very consistent response following each stimulus. That's because the brain's doing a million other things in addition to processing our little stimulus. To pull out the brain's response to the stimulus, we use a very simple procedure called signal averaging. First, we grab the period of EEG following each stimulus. This is called segmenting the EEG. Each segment is called an EEG epoch. Now we can take all the EEG epochs and line them up in time. In this example, each epoch contains 600 milliseconds of EEG following the stimulus onset. The epoch length depends on the nature of the specific experiment, but it's usually somewhere between 10 milliseconds and 2,000 milliseconds. To pull out the brain's consistent response to some type of event, we can simply average across the epochs for that event type. When we average across enough epochs, any activity that's consistent from trial to trial remains in the average, and any random noise simply averages out. This gives us an averaged ERP waveform. Each time point in the average waveform is simply the mean across epochs at that time point. In a typical ERP experiment, we time lock to the onset of a stimulus. In other words, time zero is stimulus onset. When we do this, we can track the flow of information about the stimulus through the brain over a period of several hundred milliseconds. For a visual stimulus, we initially see this C1 wave, which comes from primary visual cortex. Then we see this P1 wave, which comes from higher level visual areas. We then see activity related to stimulus categorization, response selection, and working memory encoding. For stimuli with a strong emotional content, we might also see emotion-related activity. As we'll discuss in another video, there's no delay between when the brain activity happens and when the voltage is picked up by our scalp electrodes. So a voltage at 293 milliseconds reflects brain activity that happened exactly at 293 milliseconds. So ERPs allow us to see the flow of information through the brain, millisecond by millisecond. In other words, the ERP technique has great temporal resolution. And given how quickly the brain works, this amazing temporal resolution allows us to study important aspects of brain function that are impossible to pull apart with techniques like fMRI that depend on the sluggish hemodynamic response. However, the ERP technique has poor spatial resolution. If you want to know where in the brain something happened, fMRI is usually much better. Although most researchers focus on stimulus-locked averages, where time zero is stimulus onset, you can instead time-lock to the response. This gives you a response-locked average. In this example, the mean response time was 576 milliseconds. That's 576 milliseconds after the time-locking point in the stimulus-locked average. In the response-locked average, this means that the stimulus was 576 milliseconds before the time-locking point. If the response time were 570 milliseconds on every trial, the response locked average would be identical to the stimulus locked average, but shifted over by 576 milliseconds. However, there's a lot of trial by trial variability in response time. This variability smears out the response related activity in the stimulus locked average, and it smears out the stimulus related activity in the response locked average. So it can be useful to look at both stimulus locked and response locked averages.